For Krima Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today are authors Angie Richardson and Lynette Mudd, here to unpack the book titled Hands Off Our Grants, Defending the Constitutional Right to Social Protection. Black Search Hands Off Our Grants campaign has helped to reveal how corruption and greed have impacted negatively on people receiving government social grants payments. So can you tell us about the campaign which aims to resolve the problem of unauthorized fraudulent deductions from social grants? Sasa entered into a five-year contract worth 10 billion rand with Cash Pay Master Services, also known as CPS, a subsidiary of Net One. Um, now, CPS was responsible for the national distribution of social grants into approximately 10 million bank accounts, affecting 17 million grant beneficiaries. And I must just highlight that social grants at the time benefited the elderly, the disabled, and children. However, at the time and prior to 2012, um, the monitoring work of the Black Session community partners, we saw an escalating trend of deductions. And these were unexplained amounts deducted from, the, from social grant um, recipients, SASA branded Grinrod bank accounts. And they did not authorize any sort of products um, such as airtime, electricity, funeral deductions or loans. We, we even saw a deduction of, um, for water of um, 800 rand. And we can say that these deductions were unauthorized. Um, sometimes they were fraudulent and sometimes they were even unlawful. But at the end of 2013, the Black Sash, supported by various civil society partners, wrote a letter to the Minister um, of Social Development, Minister Dlamini, the CEO of SASA, Virginia Peterson, and other government entities, including National Treasury and the Public Protector. Um, this act officially launched the Hands of Our Grants campaign. And at the end of January 2014, we held our first speak out at Kotza House with many of these entities attending the meeting in Johannesburg. And in that meeting, social grant beneficiaries explained these unauthorized deductions. Both the minister and Sasa were tied up somewhere else with a court case and could not attend the meeting. But in February 2014, the Minister came back and there was a meeting between Black Sash, its strategic partners um, and community partners, and the minister and officials from DSD, the Department of Social Development and SASA, to discuss the unauthorized, fraudulent and unlawful deductions that, um, that resulted in the establishment of a ministerial task team to find solutions for this phenomenon. So that's how we got started. And in Black Search's effort to better understand the root causes of this unauthorized debit deductions, so what were some of the things you uncovered? Beneficiaries came to us with complaints when we helped them to sort it out or they sorting it out themselves. They were sent from pillar to post between SASA officials, agents of CPS and Net One, other banks, other entities at their own cost and without the complaint being resolved. So we started to realize from taking up all these cases that A, it's a lengthy process, but secondly, there was no clear recourse and refund system owned and controlled by SASA. In fact, CPS was in control of the entire grant payment system, including recourse. As we traveled with grant beneficiaries, we discovered that one of the root causes was the contract between SASA and CPS. This contract was declared invalid by the Constitutional Court in the All Pay case in 2013. And there are allegations about CPS being um, favored um, by changing the, the, the biometric capabilities. And so the biometric and personal data of grant beneficiaries collected on behalf of SASA became available to other Net One subsidiaries to market and sell various financial products, including airtime, electricity, funeral policies, and microloans. These loans were also granted on children's grants, and funeral policies were also sold on children's grants. Um, there were also different interpretations of the SASA CPS contract and its appendices by the parties, 
and the role of CPS. And that required a declaratory order, and it also required um, changes to the Social Assistance Act uh, regulations. Please share with us the story of Mrs. Molaudza Grace Pohokwane, a pensioner living in Makwasi, who back in November 2013 so the deductions of 99 rand from her Sasa bank account for airtime. In the book on page 12, there is the story of um, my grace. We just call her my grace. Um, so my grace is a pensioner living in Makwasi, a small um, grain producing town, 270 kilometers south of Johannesburg, and she receives an old age pension. In November 2013, she saw a 99 rand had been deducted from her bank account for airtime. Now, my grace doesn't have a cell phone. In December 2013, 50 rand was deducted. And 99 rand was deducted in January 2014. And she was also informed by the official that an advance request for airtime was due for January 2014. So she sought the help of the Libaleng Community Advice Office in the town. And with family members, she was sent to the SASA office where the SASA officials blame my grace's relative for requesting airtime and made no further attempt to resolve her query. The advice office then approached CPS via its um, helpline to find out who had bought the airtime without my grace's consent. And while CPS could furnish the cell phone number with my grace's deduction, it claimed that it couldn't trace any name associated um, with that number. Um, the number didn't belong to anybody in my Grace's household. And so the CPS employee insisted that my Grace had provided the number in her initial application for the grant, uh, which my Grace, of course, denied. And my Grace and the paralegal from the labeling advice offices then reported the matter to the Black Sash Gauteng office, our regional office, and um, who advised them to open up a criminal case with the South African police and completed affidavits to that effect. But nothing's moved. Everything stayed the same until we decided to take my Grace's story to the meeting with us, uh, with the minister and Sasa, on the 26th of, of February. And my Grace, in that meeting, after she had asked um, for her own translator to verify my, my Grace's story, instructed the officials to refund my Grace of all these airtime deductions. And this, in fact, opened the door to um, a SASA controlled recourse and refund system. And in 2015, the Easy Pay Everywhere account, known as the Green Card, was launched. Please share with us how the new system trapped recipients in a spiral of indebtedness and facilitated fraudulent deductions. There were many issues of fraud and corruption, both within SASA, both within the beneficiaries, and they just really needed a better system um, to stamp this out. And CPS at the time uh, was one of the companies. Um, they had contracts in four provinces to the value of about 54 million, um, and they paid grants to 2.5 million social grant beneficiaries. And then what's quite interesting in the story is it's, it's either coincidentally or maybe not so coincidentally at all, a US listed technology company, Net One, acquires a company listed on the JSC called Applitech. And at that time, Applitech had a subsidiary company called CPS. So Net One acquires this company and in it, it comes CPS. At the time, when you look at the history of Net One and how it came into the social grant system, there was and it was a global trend, one would say, where the financial services industry had quite a focus on, on, on something called financial inclusion, which basically meant banking the unbanked, including people who didn't have access to the financial services sector into it. And Net One at the time appeared to be the forerunner in this. And, and one of the reasons it was is it had proprietary technology. And this technology, which was its UEPS system, it allowed it to connect with uh, grant beneficiaries offline. So it could access rural areas and um, peri-urban areas and offer financial services to people that, and it wasn't connected to the national banking infrastructure. And this was a really important part of why CPS, now owned by Net One, would win the social grant tender to become the national grant paymaster. And in 2009, 
CPS, which is another pivotal year, CPS um, has now grown. It's offering services in five provinces to about 3.5 million grant beneficiaries. But what starts happening in, in 2009 is that it starts selling financial services products through other subsidiaries of Net One. And it's also interesting when we did the research of this book and looking, um, looking through the annual reports as a listed company, Net One um, had to advise shareholders. It was at this time that Net, Net One seemed very confident that it would be the national paymaster for social grants, even though the tender hasn't yet been issued. And I would say that one of the reasons they talk about it in their um, annual report is, is something called their first and second wave business model. And this had made it very confident that would indeed win the SASA tender. But to win this tender, and this would be the, the first wave of its business model, it firstly needed to get a banking license. And to do that, it partnered with a little known bank called a Grinrod Bank. At the time, they didn't have a retail bank. But um, with NetOne's Net technology and the partnership, they were able to set up a retail bank. And then, obviously, it had its proprietary offline technology, but it also had another thing. And this thing was the biometric capability. And this was something that, at the time, government was very keen on biometrics. And you might remember, it was the start when South Africans, we would have to go to home affairs, and they started doing our biometrics. Government was, were very keen on this. The other thing that NetOne had that um, the other players in the financial services sector didn't offer was USSD technology. And what this allowed was it allowed it to process your um, airtime, uh, your debit order for needed for funeral policy, policies, etc. That was very key to have all of that in place. And to win the SAS to tender, it, it needed that so it could go into the second wave. And the second wave was really about leveraging the SASA contract for profit. And what we would find out throughout the campaign is that when grant beneficiaries, um, when NetOne won the, the contract in 2012, the bank card that was issued, the SASA Greenrod Bank, for the SASA Greenrod Bank account they each had, had a chip in it. And this chip, when a, a NetOne company subsidiary, CPS, um, any of the other ones, put it on their machines that NetOne owed, it could access all the grant beneficiaries' confidential data as well as bank accounts. And this was why, how they were going to leverage the SASA contract for profit, profits. They were going to actively sell these financial products. There were companies like Smart Life selling life insurance and funeral policies. There was Moneyline, which was the loans. And then there was a company called Manji Mobile, which, interesting, at the time of Margrace's story, this was the company that was deducting the prepaid airtime from her phone. And this company was actually owned by the son of the CEO of NetOne. As you can see, NetOne have really got what I think many at the time in the financial, financial sector considered a sure thing. It was a great business model because on the one hand, they know with the SASA contract, they are going to be in control of the money that they distribute into each of the, the each of the beneficiaries' bank accounts, and on the other hand, there's no risk to them selling loans or prepaid electricity because they have access to their bank account. So they are immediately able to deduct what is owed to them. Um, and as Lynette hinted, the whole system, the entire system, was owned by Net One. So at the time. If SASA did want to investigate what was going on, no one had access to it. The financial industry were, at the time, they were very keen on that one. And quite well-known companies such as Alan Gray, the World Bank, all jumped at the um, opportunity to invest in that one. So they've got this business model. But then in 2015, they decided to launch a new account. It was pretty much exactly the same as the SASA Grinrod account, and it was called the Easy Pay Everywhere. And the reason for this, it goes back to the Constitutional Court um, judgment in 2013 that ruled the contract between SASA and CPS invalid. The history to that is, is I mean, <laughs> CPS won the contract and almost immediately all the other bidders took them to court. And there was there was lots of, lots of controversy. And at the end of 2013, it was ruled invalid. However, the court said, okay, well, SASA doesn't have a backup plan, so we can't just stop the contract. So CPS was allowed 
to continue with the contract until its end in um, April 2017. So that was five years. And in that time, the court instructed SASA and said it needed to, take a, it needed to undertake a new procurement um, process. And either it could appoint a new service provider or it can bring the whole system, it can insource it. Why the EPE was launched is it, and we see it as we go into 2014, 2015, NetOne thinks, well, our business model is now at risk because it knows it's going to be kicked out of the system. But it, it knows its only, its only target audience are social grant beneficiaries. So launching this separate account post-2017 gave it access to social grants. And um, it estimated that around 2 million social grant beneficiaries signed up for this EPE account. Just to adjoin, um, when, when Sasa in 2015 reissued the tender um, for a new service provider, CPS made a couple of objections. And one of these objections were that the admin fee um, dropped from about 16 Rand to 14.50, that the requirement, the biometric requirement for proof of life was removed. The third objection was that there was a ring fence bank account that didn't allow for debit order EFTs, US, F, F, USSD platform deductions. That's what they use for the, for the airtime and electricity. Um, and, and this would then replace the SASA branded Grindrod bank account. That's basically a check account. And so what this would do, it would stop the automatic financial flow um, and payment for the airtime electricity policies and the, the, the funeral policies and the, and the microloans um, to any company subsidiary or otherwise allies that's under the, the umbrella of Net One, And so CPS didn't um, submit a, a proposal in that regard. In fact, what they did was that they launched this new EPE, EPE account. It was a product of Moneyline and Grinrod Bank. Um, and it had exactly the same features as the Sasa branded Grinrod Bank account. And so you could also do biometrics, but there was no, at the time, there was no terms and conditions for this account. It only came later and uh, people would then also um, use that to sell the microloans and so forth. So um, just to say that NetOne was a forerunner in terms of this campaign for financial inclusion and social grant beneficiaries were then, or the SASA contract was then used as an opportunity to bank the unbanked. There were many poor people that didn't have bank accounts. They received cash money um, at pay points. And this was an attempt to move that entire category into the banking system. Now, beneficiaries will tell you long stories about the, the EPE account. Uh, but before I go there to the specifics, I just want to say that there was a matter in the Supreme Court of Appeal and it was in the, in the case of the Minister of Social Development and others, and also Net One and others, um, in the Supreme Court of Appeal. And the judgment there on the 27th of September 2018 was, um, and I'm just paraphrasing, but it was uncontested that the amendments, and to, in brackets to the Social Assistance Act, uh, were motivated by the concern of the Minister Sasa and Civil Society about the alleged predatory marketing practices by vendors who were intent on selling their financial products within the social grant system to social grant beneficiaries and receiving payment by debit order and EFT. There were also allegations of unauthorized deductions from bank accounts of beneficiaries and studies reveal how the elderly receiving grants were often illiterate, struggled with the technology and could easily be taken advantage of. There was therefore general agreement that social grant beneficiaries should be protected against unscrupulous vendors and corrupt um, activities. And that's just a, 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 a piece from that court case. But um, CPS agents were also working at SASA Paypoints, and often they would be the same people who sell funeral policies and loans to people. The chip on the card gives them access to biometric and personal information of grant beneficiaries. Um, this card, the EPE card, was linked to the Sasa Grinrod um, uh, bank account as like another bank account in that structure. 
and it was open from the booth of cars at private residences in vehicles by agents who earned commission on aggressively marketing the EPE card. The terms and conditions were often not available or they were not explained to grant beneficiaries. Um, it referred to EPE branches, um, but we haven't seen these except for net one branches and information was only in English. And in desperation, grant beneficiaries would visit the net one offices in an attempt to obtain a statement or close their bank account. This would involve traveling some distances at their own cost to the approximately 120 um, net one branches at the time. And just to give you an illustration, a rural beneficiary who lives in Sierras would have to travel 100 kilometers to Vista to have this query attended to. Um, and so it was costly and it was challenging. And it seemed near impossible to challenge the EPE, to cancel the EPE card or to close the bank account. When um, the beneficiaries visited these Net One offices, they would often not be allowed any support. Uh, maybe a relative, a friend, or even the Black Sash paralegals would often accompany people to these offices. It was only beneficiaries who would be allowed into these offices. And beneficiaries were charged an extra 10 rand administrative fee for this account um, per month, in addition to the amount um, that SASA was paying for the SASA branded Grinrod um, bank account. And there's a story in the book um, of a woman by the name of Elise on page 21 um, of the book, who explains how Elise had struggled to, um, she went um, for a loan and then uh, her, the loan came off a child support grant and she was told that she qualified for 500 grand loan and um, that the, the fees payable was uh, 540 um, and she understood that um, there will be installments per month of um, 50 rand over six months. But when you add up the, the payments, the pay, that payment would only give you um, 300 rand. And then we realized that um, Ms. Elise signed a loan agreement, but she was unable to read. And so there was lots of challenges to help her to cancel this account um, and get the loan paid off. And she was sent from SASA office in Google Air to back to the net one office, um, et cetera. And every time they told her, that um, it was cancelled. And this thing went on and on and on for months on end. And she even went to the SASA officers and they said, well, they can't do anything about this. This is, this is entirely up to CPS and net, and net one. People were also sent to their house saying that they were coming to inspect her claim, um, et cetera. But it was an endless process and months after this, she was able to stop the card. People also spoke about having to speak over the telephone to uh, get these, these deductions um, stopped. And so, yeah, it was, it was uh, quite an ordeal for, for many of the people once they had gone um, into uh, or, or been converted um, to the EPE. Often they were also told that this was the replacement SASA card. And lastly... Talk to us about how media can play a vital role in empowering the public with regard to working of the social security system. Throughout the book, um, we rely on, on, on media and, and media did an incredible job, you know, at the start um, of the campaign to, about to 2016, really doing some very in-depth investigations. Amma Bogani with Sam Sol and Craig McKinney, they really took the hood of what was going on at Net One. And I know that Craig spent countless hours pretending to be a grant beneficiary and he took flights to PE to find out who were underwriting these funeral policies and loans etc. We also had financial journalists um, and Krati from the Business Day who would who would actually um, you know let us know like you know Alan Gray has invested in this company but really what media did was they provided a spotlight on an issue and the people involved in this issue they couldn't go anywhere because this, they had this constant spotlight. And, and this spotlight, you know, you know, the minister might say one thing, but then she would do another thing. Or Sasa would commit to doing something and then it never happened. And that's where the media became valuable. I think most importantly, um, 
especially um, media like Ground Up, they became a, a portal for, for brand beneficiaries because there was so much confusion during the seven year campaign, especially when the EPE was launched. And, you know, are brands going to be paid? in April 2017. Um, and to this day, Roundup still has that portal going. Also, uh, you know, in, when we were doing our research, MPs in their efforts to try hold uh, the minister, um, the department and SASA accountable, used many, on many occasions, used media articles and reports um, to understand, better understand what was going on. So yeah, I think media are, are pivotal um, and our experience in working with them during this campaign is they, they put, put a lot of time and effort into really understanding the technicalities of it. And there were multiple court cases. They took the time and effort to, to ensure that their reporting was accurate. That was Angie Richardson and Lynette Mudd speaking to Krima Media's Polity about hands-off our grants.